Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Cooper Hewitt's National Design Week, uh, celebrating its 20th year. Today's winner's salon, uh, 20 by 20, shares the National Design Award winners with you through 20 20 minute programs. Uh, my name is Carolyn Royston. I'm Chief Experience Officer here at the Cooper Hewitt, and I'm honored to moderate this discussion with Amy Smith, founding director of MIT D Lab. Uh, when winner of the Corporate and Institutional Achievement Award uh, for the National Design Awards. Uh, the design talk topic today will focus on empowerment through participatory design. Uh, this is going to be fun, fast, um, and inspiring. Uh, so let's get started. Amy, thank you. So my first question. Um, the MIT D-Lab got its start as the Haiti class, a single project-based class that was hands-on and rooted in the real world. How has that class transformed into what the D-Lab has become? Great, well, thank you. And first of all, I would like to say it is both a pleasure and an honor to be here. So um, thank you um, very much for uh, selecting D-Lab as, as one of the National Design Award winners. Um, it's very exciting for us. Um, especially because, as you talked about, uh, you know, we had uh, a very, let's say, very humble beginnings. I, I had come back to MIT after serving in the Peace Corps for four years and wanted to start a program that would have been the class I would have wanted to take when I was an undergraduate but didn't exist. And so I was very interested in um, development work, international development work, and how, um, how can you apply the skills, the practical knowledge that you're gaining through classes at MIT in a way that can impact people's lives. And so so the very first class was called the Haiti class, as you mentioned, and I worked with um, some students from the Haitian Students Alliance in order to create a class that sort of simulated you know, essentially my Peace Corps experience, where we started by learning about the culture, learning some of the language, learning about different sectors of development. And then I took a group of 10 students to Haiti and we worked in collaboration with community partners in order to identify challenges. And then we came back and held a design class where we looked at creating solutions to those challenges. And then in the summer, we had a chance to go back and implement them. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was a remarkable class. And um, you know, it, was, uh, it was just really empowering to see you know, what, what could you do in this type of forum. And so, um, so we grew quite a bit afterwards. And the very first way we grew was geographically, where other student associations found out what we had done. And they're like, oh, we want to do a program in India. Let's do one in Brazil. And, and, and we didn't feel like we could call the next class the Haiti, India, Brazil class. And so that's when we came up with D-Lab as the name where we focus on development and design and dissemination of technologies that can improve the lives and livelihoods of people around the world. So, so we started by increasing geographically, and that meant also the program increased in size. So we went from, at the time, one staff member to now we have 25. We went from you know, a pair of classes to we now have over 20 classes. We went from one country to now, you know, any given year, we probably have projects in 20 countries around the world. Um, so we, you know, we grew a lot. We you know, went from a, you know, the old shipping and receiving room in the basement of MIT to now we have windows. It's awesome. <laughs> And we actually have the whole floor of a building, um, and uh, and we uh, and so we sort of grew quite a bit in size. But we've also grown in scope. So it's um, it's not just academics. We although we do continue our academic program, and it's very much a cornerstone of what we do. We have a research program. And we also have what we call our innovation practice program, which is essentially our field work. And so we have these three pillars, which are, um, are sort of different ways that we enact our philosophy around the world. And I would say that that's the other thing that is that grew over time was sort of the way that we looked at design and the role that design plays in development. So initially, you know, we very much were looking at what are challenges and what are solutions that we could create for people who experience those challenges. Right? And then, um, and the more we worked in that way, the more we realized that there's a lot more power in working more collaboratively. What are solutions we can create together with people who are facing those challenges? And then over time, we also recognized the power in sort of providing design training so that solutions are being created by the people who are facing those challenges. And so those three paradigms, um, and it's not that we've abandoned any of them, but th the expansion into those three different paradigms, I think, is one of the biggest areas of growth that we've had. And the challenge, of course, is figuring out 
when is the right time and place to use which of those paradigms. But I think fundamentally, those are, you know, that to me is the biggest growth that we've had as an organization over the years. Fascinating, thank you. Um, MIT D-Lab isn't, isn't just about the product design, it's about the processes of design. And I just wondered, how, how are you and your students working with people living in poverty to create a sustainable life cycle of design? Yeah, no, that's uh, great and a natural extension from this discussion around philosophy. And, um, you know, one of the things that I realized is that, um, like, how many people, I, and I can't see very well, but how many people here might call themselves designers? Yeah. How many people here have made something, anything in their lives? Okay. That, that more hands go up in that case, yeah. Um, and how do you feel when you're, when you're done, when you make something and it works? I mean, it's a pretty great feeling, right? You feel, you feel, first of all, happy and joyful. Secondly, you might feel proud of yourself, a sense of accomplishment. And then you feel like you can do anything, you know? You put together that IKEA bookshelf and they're like, bring it on, world, I'm ready to go, you know? And so these intangible parts are part of the process of design, right? And, and it, it's not just the product, but the act of making a product that has an impact. And I personally believe that development is about transformation. And if you give someone a technology, there's a transformation in one dimension, but not multiple dimensions. If someone creates that technology for themselves, then that creates a transformation in many more dimensions. And so this process of design, I think, is a critical component about how we think about development and those intangible aspects, which are really important. If people are going to lift themselves out of poverty, if you're going to have long-term sustainable change, you want people who believe that they can create the change they need to change their lives, right? And that comes through doing the design, not receiving the design. So a lot of what I you know, have the pleasure of doing with my job is to go around the world and do design workshops, teaching people about the design process and building their both comfort and capacity. And not just working with people who are already carpenters and blacksmiths and you know, welders, but people who do not think of themselves as as creators, let's say, and just building that capacity. And then what is a joyful thing is seeing what are the things that they make that improve their lives. And sometimes it's small things just to improve comfort around the household, and other times it's a livelihood which fundamentally changes their, um, their household's economic experience, in many cases doubling or tripling their family income. And so these are things that I think are really important. And, that, um, and I feel like too often we think about just the products of design and innovation and not the process of design and innovation. So one of the things that I, I feel is part of our mission in D-Lab is to try to get people to think about both of those things. Fantastic, and just as a follow-on, in terms of um, a project life cycle, do you return to those places um, several times after your first visit, or can you just explain a little bit about that process? Sure, absolutely we do. And, and what we try to do, in, in addition to whether or not we visit, we will work with local partners, um, because uh, it's really important to have mentorship uh, when you're going through any sort of um, educational experience. And so what we'll try to do is sort of create something of a local innovation ecosystem, which includes a place where people can work, access to tools and materials, and access to sort of technical advice and mentorship. And so, um, you know, our, our vision is to create these sort of small local innovation ecosystems where people can learn about the design process, be supported in it, and then support others. And, you know, and there's a, a few communities where we've actually um, been able to see this progression happen, and it's, it's very rewarding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us an example of one of the problems that D-Lab is currently working to solve? Sure, and uh, of course the biggest challenge would be like the word one, um, <laughs> because we're working on a lot of different things, you know. So through our classes and, and research, we work on a variety of particular products. Um, 
On my side, what I've been uh, doing a lot of work with is looking at the humanitarian sector, so working with people who have been displaced by either conflict or by natural um, disasters, and trying to look at how could we take this same um, methodology and change the way that refugees and displaced people are involved in the humanitarian sector. Um, currently, there's a lot of, of donations and you know giving, but not a lot of um, you know sort of empowering people to be designing and creating solutions either for themselves or in collaboration with humanitarian organizations. So one of the projects that we're, we're working towards is, again, developing um, sort of tools and curriculum and um, pilot studies that can help to build sort of build that so that refugees are you know, creating their own livelihoods, um, improving their own lives, working with humanitarian organizations to do even more effective programming so that you don't find things where people receive solar cookers. Okay, here's another audience question. How many of you cook with a solar cooker? Yeah, if you, oh really? <laughs> That's remarkable. And quite honestly, if we were in a refugee camp and I asked the same question, it would be about the same number of people because it's, it's not largely a super convenient. Like, do you cook all your meals on a solar cooker? 50%? No. 20%? No. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> And that's one of the challenges. I often joke that solar cookers are the way we want everyone else to cook, right? Because it's so sustainable. And there are certainly places where they are effective. So I'm not totally dissing it, but the challenge is when they're distributed to people with no regard to the way they want to be cooking. Right, and so so you'll find often in refugee camps um, solar cookers which have been discarded, which have been taken apart, so that you can use you know the little pot to go on the top of your roof to prevent rain coming through or something like that. So so looking at how could we change the paradigm of humanitarian aid so that people are more effectively. Um, getting access to the things that they need and they want, rather than things that other people think they need or want. And so, so that's a project that we're working on that I'm very excited about, and, um, and we hope that we'll be able to sort of continue making inroads in both building the design capacity amongst the local um, uh, population, but also building the opportunity for co-creation between those who are running programs and those who are receiving the benefits from it. Fantastic. And you've been running uh, iterations of, of D-Lab now for 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are some of the long-term transformations that you've seen in the communities that you've been uh, partnering with? Great, yeah, and I can give a couple of different examples. So um, one example was just some, uh, you know, quite a while ago, I, I used to work with a, uh, a village in, in Ghana, in the Branghafo region. And, um, and in the early days, we, had, um, we used to do a lot of work with uh, doing water quality testing and water assessments within villages. And we had, uh, we had done this where we had tested a lot of the different um, sources in, in the community. And you know, the, I think the second or third year when I went there, we went down to the river. And I noticed that there was much less activity at the riverside than when I had first gone. And I was, my, uh, my colleague at the time was Pastor George Fuache. And I was like, Pastor George, why is no one here? And he's like, well, last year you came and you showed us this water was badly contaminated. So people don't come here for their drinking water anymore. Um, they just come on Saturdays to do their laundry. And you know, that was something that was very powerful. And I think you know, the way we did the water testing was we engaged people, we um, you know, taught them how to do the testing, and we showed the results at the, um, at the community meeting, and they changed their water habits. You know? And so that was, um, that was something. And I think it happened because of the inclusive way that we did the testing. Um, another case is around a project that we've done to, um, to help enhance people who are making charcoal out of agricultural waste material. Um, cooking fuel is a, is a huge challenge around the world, and in many countries, deforestation is a big issue. Um, and you can make a, a clean burning, environmentally cook friendly cooking fuel out of agricultural waste. Um, but it's strange, right? It's not things that people have looked at, and, um, and it's not something they've seen before. And one of the things that we've noticed, in a particularly in one area where we've been working with a, um, a successful entrepreneur in this space, is that initially, when we went there, you couldn't find a charcoal briquette you know, um, anywhere. But now, everyone there is familiar with them. You can find them in the market. You know, when you talk about
about Betty, they're like, oh, the charcoal lady, yeah, we know her. And, you know, and she's gone from making you know, sort of uh, a, a few hundred briquettes a day to she's actually just installed the machinery to be making three tons of charcoal a day so that she can help to satisfy the cooking needs of families and institutions in the region without having to cut down trees. So that's, you know, um, so that's another example. And then finally, just the personal examples of people who um, have gone through the design process and, you know, make changes in their lives. Uh, <laughs> there's one group where there was a, a number of sort of elderly, um, uh, elderly members of the community group, and it's an area in Uganda where they use squat toilets, um, so squat latrines. And how many people here have used a, a, a squat pit latrine? Yeah, and <laughs> how many of you are over 50? Yeah, and how many of you know have noticed how much harder it is to get up from one of those? <laughs> yeah, so so this group just dev designed some elevated toilet seats, and now obviously, uh, like many of us went to the bathroom today on an elevated toilet seat, sure enough. And um, but in this region, they didn't have them. But just th this community was like, "Wow, this is a pain. Let's change it." And so to me, that's one of the powerful things about teaching design is that when you have a challenge, you find a way to solve it, and then from there, the group now sells these toilet seats around the village. So they've you know, turned it into a small vis business. So if you ever want a genuine Ugandan toilet seat, let me know and I'll hook you up. <laughs> so good to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you thought this wouldn't be a useful chat. <laughs> I, I, had, I have no idea. Um, so, I <laughs> so I just wanted to, to sort of finish up with, um, with a question really about the future. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we've talked about the sort of iterations over the last 17 years, but I'm just wondering as we kind of look at the way, uh, particularly I suppose impact of climate change as one example, um, w what you envisage perhaps for MITD Lab in the, in the future and where you think your focus and your effort might be? Thanks, and that, that of course is a bit of a, a, a challenging question, but a, a, a good one, and, um, and there will be people on the D-Lab staff who agree with me and those who don't, but I'll share a, a, a little bit of my thoughts, um, which is, uh, you know, I think that our, our vision of how you can use design to impact people's lives is we've done a lot of it on the sort of individual and community basis, but I think that one of the things that we're really seeking to do is to have an impact on a much larger scale. So to have sort of some of these methodologies that we've been developing implemented on a large global scale for large global problems. So are there ways that we can do design trainings with people who are experiencing the challenges of climate change so that they can be creating the technologies, the programs, the systems, the uh, products that they need in order to adapt to these conditions. And we've actually been doing a small um, pilot project on that in El Salvador with, um, with Oxfam. And, um, and, and so looking at how can, how can we sort of democratize design, crowdsource solutions in a way that really respects and in harnesses the, um, the creativity and ingenuity of people who are living in poverty around the world. Fantastic, and I look forward to watching what you do with great interest. Thank you so much, Amy, uh, for this very short talk, um, but very informative. And uh, thanks to all of you in the audience for being a part of this conversation. Um, I, we're on a very tight schedule, I've been told. So um, if you wouldn't mind leaving the room. Um <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's like the bad e the bad end to a party, isn't it? Where everywhere you bring the coats out. Um, but if, if you <laughs> um, but if you wouldn't mind leaving the room when the lights go up, um, <laughs> so we can prepare it for for the next round of talks. But if you'd like to give a big round of applause to Amy, thank you so much. Thank you.